we will get started. So thank you, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Rigudo, and I am a certified international trade professional, CITP for short, and also the partnerships and community lead at FIT, the Forum for International Trade Training. I have been a CITP for 12 years, and I am just so thrilled to host this event on such a topical subject, a subject that admittedly, I really don't have a firm grasp of, <laughs> but I suspect that I will after today's panel session. So this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email. Also the chat function is available to you to introduce yourselves and to chat during the webinar. So please feel free to drop um, your questions for our panelists um, in the Q&A box. Um, the chat, you can introduce yourselves, but please uh, use the Q&A box to drop your questions. And we will save 45, uh, we will save 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to get to those questions and, uh, and answer them for you. So we acknowledge and give thanks for this opportunity to join you today from the unceded territory and homeland of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Wherever you are on Turtle Island, please take a moment to recognize and respect the ancestral custodians, nations, and peoples who lived on these lands long before any settler, each with their own unique culture, language, and history. So FIT is very pleased to be offering this webinar today in partnership with GS1 Canada. So for those who are new to FIT, we are the Forum for International Trade Training, the global leader in international trade training and the certification of international trade professionals. You may have heard me mention that I am a CITP, like many of my colleagues who are on this webinar today, um, which is the world's most recognized professional designation for global business professionals built on competency standards set by FIT. So we are very pleased to be offering this webinar in partnership with GS1 Canada, a not-for-profit association that develops and maintains global standards for efficient business communication in supply chain management, and is one of 116 GS1 member organizations around the world. But what does that actually mean? <laughs> There's a lot of efficient business communication and supply chain management. Perhaps I can answer by mentioning, um, or answer my own question by mentioning that GS1 barcodes are scanned 10 billion times a day. Just to put that in perspective, 10 billion times a day. And GS1 standards are the most widely used system of standards in the world. So now I think I may have your attention. At this time, please allow me to introduce you to Alain Picard. So Alain is an, ad uh, an advisor with the community engagement team at GS1 Canada. This was a new division created in early 2022 with the main objective of supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs to get their products to market quickly and efficiently. Part of his mandate is to work closely with trade associations and educational institutions alike, supporting, educating, and familiarizing their members with GS1 global standards, emphasizing the importance of minimizing startup and scale up hurdles, which is what FIT also does. It's about minimizing the risk, um, understanding, navigating some of those complexities. Um, as a previous business owner in wholesale packaging and distribution, Alant truly enjoys sharing his experience and building relationships, which I can personally attest to. So thank you, Alain. Um, today's webinar will demystify barcodes by explaining why unique product identification is important, when your product should get a barcode, and how to set up and manage your barcodes for business. So Alain, I am absolutely thrilled to have you join FIT and our audience, and thank you so much in advance for sharing your valuable experience and expertise with us today. So I'm not quite sure if I did 
uh, GS1 Canada and your mandate, uh, if I did it justice, if you want to add anything about that. Otherwise, we can dive in. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Alain. Great, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for those kind words and that great introduction. You summed it up quite well. Uh, just to give a brief history on how we got to where we are today. Uh, in September 2022, I had a first meeting with Leanne Redmond, um, a former uh, colleague of yours. Um, and we started talking about how our energies and how our initiatives would align. We felt that uh, FIT was a great fit in terms of bringing an alignment of what we do versus what you do, especially since we are an international company with our roots here at GS1 Canada, starting in Canada. So that was the first and foremost objective for us to put FIT on a target list. And then from there, I was introduced as Leanne moved on, I was introduced to Pamela Hyatt, who then introduced me to Laura, uh, and that's where things really started moving. Laura and I have had three, four great conversations uh, over the past year or so. And um, it really has led us to realize the importance of where we fit and how fit fits into the equation and what we're able to share as much as possible with all your members, all the, the intermediates that are going to take part here today and participants from all realm of industry. We are very uh, uh, neutral in our approach. We are not sector specific. We cover all the sectors. So by being that um, uh, neutral and not for profit, there is nothing for us to gain other than sharing as much information as we have to help those business owners get their product to market and understand what it takes to get in with some trading partners along the way. So very pleased to be here. I would also like to mention that Linda Antoniades, our senior manager is joining us today from GS1 Canada. And she will be, as we go along, putting some resource material uh, right into our Q&A or our chat box. So for you, as we go along through the topics, there'll be some resource material available to you. And once we're all done, I'm also going to share uh, some slide uh, uh, documents with Laura that she'll be able to send to you so you can put a little bit of an image to our discussion here today. So we'll try and share as much information as possible so that you're as much aware. And again, during and post feel free, you'll have our, uh, our coordinates and you'll be able to send us information and ask questions either through Laura or directly to us. So again, thank you for having us here today. Well, that is great. Thank you. Thank you for, for you know, laying the foundation of why we were jointly hosting this webinar today and, uh, and the similarities and the end goal is really to, to help businesses, to, to help uh, professionals navigate the complexities of, uh, you know, in our case, international trade, and in your case, you know, product, moving product, getting product into markets, whether that's domestic, international. So there's a lot of synergy there between our, our organizations. So thank you, Alain, for, for summarizing that. That's great. Um, so let's dive in. <laughs> Let, let's dive in with the fundamental question. You know, what is a product barcode? What makes up a barcode? What's a G10? I've heard you talk about this before. So let's do uh, barcode 101, if we can start with that. Absolutely. Um, we refer to barcodes in, in, in a common way in the industry. A barcode at the end of the day is only referred to as a symbology. It is a symbol. It doesn't mean nothing. It is a symbol that is scannable and readable with POS systems and inventory control management and shipping logistics system. At the end of the day, what is key and the difference between a GTIN and a barcode is a GTIN, which refers to global trade item number, is the number that is assigned to a specific product. It is a unique number that is assigned to a product that resides, in many cases, underneath the barcode symbology. 
So the difference between the barcode is the symbol. The GTIN is the actual numbering scheme that identifies that product and carries that product throughout the supply chain. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, so can you explain the difference between a G10 and a UPC? Is this sure. interchangeable? Yeah. At the end of the day, they mean the same thing with a but. The but being a UPC code, as we know it, is only used and essentially only used in North America. It comprises a 12-digit number. That number, being the GTIN, is encoded into the symbology, which is um, commonly referenced to up as a linear barcode. We've all seen them. They're the, still the most popular one out there. And that number is the GTIN. The UPC is called a universal product code, only used in North America. The power of the GTIN through GS1 Canada is that it can encode 8, 12, 13, 14, and GS1 128 numeric codes. Why all these standards? An EAN 13, as an example, is a European code and is essentially used pretty well everywhere around the world other than North America which uses what we refer to as a UPC 12-digit code. The important difference is with GS1, whether you have an 8, a 12, a 13, or a 14, it is recognizable throughout the world because we operate these standards in 116 countries. The UPC 12, which originates, let's assume, from the U.S. or only specifically in Canada, will not be readable throughout the network across the world. A GS1 GTIN will be. And that is the big difference between a world standard, which we govern, versus a regional standard, which are essentially regional. Great. That is a great explanation. Thank you. So if we're, uh, for all those businesses, uh, on this webinar who are trying to understand this through a shipping and logistics lens. Can you now speak a little bit about the difference between the like, point of sale and then all the shipping and logistics barcode identifiers? Um, cases, yeah. the, the, the whole... The whole shebang. Shipping. Without getting too deep into the weeds... Let's go back to our original GTIN. The global trade item number is where it all begins. You identify a specific unit, usually for a point of sale, for the consumer in this case. So we'll use the consumer as the example. You have a jar of jam. That jar of jam is identified with a GTIN and a respective barcode which is the symbol that's going to be commonly used on that jar of jam, which in our case is the linear barcode. So once that is established, now we got to get that jar to the retailer and or the marketplace or the online site to be able to be sold. In between the creation and the sale, there's a lot that happens. So now you have to move that jar of jam you're obviously not going to move them by the jar. You'll be moving them in all likelihood in a case format. Let's now assume that you have a 12 pack of jam. That case in itself will need a separate GTIN, otherwise known as a case code, tied into the original GTIN. So the original GTIN is the item that's going to be sold to ship that case, it's going to have its code for control purposes. And that code normally entails 14 digits. That 14 digit code will not be able to be sold at the point of sale. It won't be recognizable because it is only recognizable through the shipping network, through the supply chain. 
from a control standpoint, I'm not going to ship by the case, especially with a group like we have here today. You're shipping overseas. You might have been shipping by pallets, by containers, by truckloads. Nine different case hierarchies could be established per GTIN. So I have a POS, I have a jar, I have a 12 pack. I now have 36 cases of 12 on a pallet over six layers. And then I'm going to take that pallet and I'm going to have 32 pallets in a, in a container and or a shipping container. Every one of those hierarchies will have its own GTIN assigned to it, all deriving from the original GTIN on the product. None of those configurations will be sold at a point of sale, but will be controlled along the supply chain. Now, that 12 pack, if we were to sell that 12 pack, not only as an individual jar, and I'm going to use water bottles, which is an easier example. I can sell the individual water bottle or I can sell it in the case of 12 and the case of 24, which is very common in the marketplace. With that example, the unit would have its G the 12 pack will have a separate GTIN for point of sale and the 24 pack will have a separate GTIN, again, in our case, 12 digit GTIN so that it could be sold individually as a 12 pack and a 24 pack to the consumer. Then you have all those individual case hierarchies for the single, for the 12s, for the 24s and the skids pallets, container loads. That in a nutshell kind yeah, of Yeah, no, that's encompasses. that's great. That's a lot to unpack. No pun right. intended. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> but <laughs> um I'm sure that you have some tools. I have seen some tools on your website which helps um you know businesses uh, estimate how many GTINs they need. And Correct. yeah. So I'm sure Linda will uh, will drop that in the <laughs> chat. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so let's get a little bit away from the the technical, let's say, and let's get more into maybe business insights. So you've given us a great overview of barcodes and and GTINs and and uh, the the standards. Um, around the world, what's used UPC versus EAN. But, okay, so I'm thinking for the businesses on the line, maybe startups or maybe those individuals that consult small businesses. So why, why are barcodes important when you're starting a business or more specifically creating a new product line? Um, and what do you need to do to make sure your, your product is market ready? And then if you can talk a little bit about timelines too. Um, so if just assuming a startup just starting out, when should they be thinking? Uh, when should folks be thinking of barcodes? Yeah, there's a couple of guidelines that we like to use and refer to and share. If your objective is to sell small quantity, regional, uh, small flea markets, uh, small markets, so on and so forth, you don't necessarily need to go down the whole realm of a barcode and a JIT and, and a subscription package. That being said, if you aspire to grow your business and scale up your business to be able to increase productivity, and more importantly, get in with the trading partners. We call them trading. What is a trading partner? In the food industry, Metro, Loblaws, Walmart, Amazon. They're all trading partners that deal with GS1 and are part of GS1 in our data pool. So the first question is, when should I start? It depends on where you want to take your product and how far you want to go. We always encourage to get a barcode very early. Reason being, when you're going to pitch that product to a trading partner, we always encourage you showing that you're ready, you're able to produce, 
and you have all your ducks lined up, nutrition facts tables, bilingual labels, all your essential health and safety uh, areas that need to be in compliance so that you are not sent back packing afterwards. The importance of the barcode right from the get-go is that in GS1, we have those check boxes for you as you create. What do you need? You need a French and English description. You're going to need a case pack. You're going to need your hierarchy. So it preempts you and prepares you for when you are facing a, an important trading partner, or now you need to get in officially in the supply chain, all those check boxes are had. So if you aspire to move as early as possible, if you're still dabbling and wanting to see if your product is going to fly or not, no need to jump in. But as soon as you want to get into some serious trading partners, you absolutely need a GTIN, you need a barcode, all your compliance areas need to be checked off. Wow, that's great. It's all about being, you know, being ready, being ready to go to market. And looks like you have a system that enables folks to, to get market ready, those checklists and the data management and that's because fantastic. at a certain point in time, those are, uh, they're necessaries, they're obligations for you to move forward and to create your GTINs and barcodes. And then once you're at the point of putting your product info in the system, you'll have to have all that information in place. From a timeline standpoint, to come back to your second question, again, it's to be ready to fly. You'd hate to get an order or a commitment from a trading partner or an importer outside the country and have five boxes still to check off or having to go back and reproduce your label or your cases or your shipping containers because you didn't preempt that right from the get-go or at least during that stage where you're really soliciting and trying to get some business to fly because that will stall your process, may even cost you. Hey, we talked about saving those costly hurdles. These are costly hurdles. If you moved ahead and got a deal on 25,000 labels or cases only to realize that they're not in compliance and they're not going to fly with your trading partner. So these are the types of things we try and eliminate from the get-go uh, so that you minimize those hurdles. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you, so how much time like if you have, if you're starting to get all your ducks in a row, you're starting mm -hmm. to get everything, you know, you've compiled all that data, you have, you know, your own checklist. So if um, folks on this call were to subscribe to GS1 Canada or any other GS1 member organization, how much time does it take? Are we talking a couple of days? Are we talking a couple of months? I just need to know, or I think people, folks would like to know how long it might take. Yeah, the, the subscription process is quite, it's quite rapid because it happens online. The key thing is, is have all the information lined up. You know, registries, your registration, your permits, um, you know, your revenue stream, who you're selling to, who you're not selling to, so on, so on, so on. These are all the prerequisite questions. Let's assume you've got all that. Within 48 hours, normally, you get your welcome, you get your portal access, and if in the case where, uh, let's assume you're getting a package with 10 GTINs, those 10 GTINs will be available to you upon your portal admission. You will sign in, create your passcodes, your logins, and you're off to the races. So it is quite rapid in the sense that if you've got everything lined up, you got all the information to answer the prerequisite questions, throw a credit card in there, buy your license, and you're off to the races normally within 48 hours. Perfect, perfect. But what's important to, you know, to keep in mind is that when you're doing that export planning, creating that export plan, um, you need to understand all those, all that, uh, all that information that's required in order to get the G10. So start, you know, figuring that out, compiling that information so that when they 
are ready to apply or subscribe and get the GTIN, all that is, is ready. So it needs to be in that export planning. Okay. Right. And it's, it's, they're fundamental questions. There's nothing, there's nothing really hard. What, what we need to find out is who you are, what your business, where you're registered, what your plan is, are you importing, exporting, so that we can lead you into to a process where we're going to know at our end what you're going to need, what you're asking for, and then afterwards, when you need the support, you know, because we have support services, they'll know exactly who you are, size of company, boom, 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 contact information, all that preliminary thing so that the va-et-vient, the back and forth can, can happen accordingly. Right. Okay. What if we were, what if we were to switch hats and how about we think about the importers? Maybe there are importers on this webinar. So maybe can you walk us through some of the considerations for importers? Like who would register with GS1? You know, the foreign, the exporter, the importer, both? I, I don't know. So what are your recommendations here? Yeah, it depends on the product. Couple of things. Um, again, without going too deep, depends on the product. If we'll give an example, if the product is ready made, it already has a GTIN. Let's say you're importing from Italy and it has a GTIN. Then you don't need to recreate another GTIN, providing that item is ready to be sold as is. The sub example to that is if you're bringing in different components or in food, different ingredients, and it's being co-packed here in Canada. So you're importing a series of products to be able to pack it and send it to a trading partner. Then we always recommend a local GTIN, a Canadian GTIN subscription so that you can identify because the brand owner is a combination of you're not selling the brand owner from point A to point Z. You're going through an intermediate and that control becomes very important because if you call back and you decide to use one supplier versus another, you don't have to worry about their GTIN. You are controlling the GTIN that's already in the market. Keeping in mind um, that GTINs are permanently assigned. You can't turn around and say, well, I'm not selling this product anymore. I'm going to take that jeet and put it on another product. It doesn't work that way. It takes on a life of its own. So if you get to control that process here, we always recommend get your own subscription with a jeet. Now, if you're selling through trading partners and the product is a finished product and you are now a distributor or a broker, we then encourage your subscription to not include the GTIN, but to include the services that the trading partner is going to need. If you're selling online or through a marketplace, they may need content, imaging, e-commerce information. All those areas are available through GS1. You don't need to book a GTIN because the GTIN is usable, but your trading partner needs Marketing, it needs marketing collateral, planogram uh, images, uh, six dimensional or six shot images. Then you then get into a GS1 subscription, excluding the GTINs and, and the product ID because it's already in there. Okay. So it's, it's two examples, a finished product, a part finished product, and then uh, what the trading partner is looking for. So in some cases, it's your own subscription. In some cases, it's two subscriptions because the GTIN is already coming in from Italy. And the third is part of a subscription to cater to your trading partner needs here in Canada. Okay. Okay. That's very interesting. And I suppose if anybody is a little overwhelmed with that, I mean, we <laughs> did mention you do have support available to help folks sure. navigate through this, correct? Yes, yes. And okay. it all stems, again, the all important, back to your first question, why the importance of a barcode or a GTIN? Everything revolves around the GTIN. It is the unique product ID, whether it's Italy, Germany, France, USA, that's the stem of it. And for us, by having that at your own GTIN, either here or as an import, we're able to trace everything back accordingly. And that's key. 
Okay. So you just mentioned trace. So I just, <laughs> <laughs> what about traceability? You know, we all know how important that is. So what if, for instance, there's a recall? So how, how do barcodes play a role in, in traceability? Again, it all stems from having that unique product identifier in GTIN. Within our system, we have a recall process, which is very efficient. Reason being, every trading partner that's part of our system, let's say you're selling to three trading partners and you need to recall the product. Upon going into the system to recall that product, it's done once because we're part of the registry. By updating that once, all your trading partners know there's a recall. It is traced where? Back to the GTIN, back to the unique product identifier. This product, one, two, three, four, five, is recalled from these three trading partners who are selling this product. The power of the registry in the data pool is that you do it once and it's good for all. Okay, so this goes back to, I'm just looking at my introduction of GS1 <laughs> NSS, <laughs> Global Standards for Efficient Business Communication. <laughs> so you just gave us a prime example of efficient business communication. Right, right. Uh -oh. and, and again, everyone's reading the same info. Everyone in that trading partner world from brand manufacturers to importers to brokers to distributors if you're in the database, if you're in the GS1 registry or what we call ECC net registry, you're all talking the same language. Right. Okay. And these types of systems, recalls and notifications and certifications, and there's a lot of IMS, and I think we'll touch on that a little bit later, but those industry managed solutions have all been created to be able to simplify the process for everyone involved in the supply chain. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so I'm just wondering, we've mentioned various channel partners. We kind of touched a little bit on, you know, the online, the marketplaces. Um, let's talk a little bit more. Let's dive a little bit more into the e-commerce space. Um, you know, some best practices with this constantly, you know, evolving e-commerce space with respect to barcode. So I don't know, maybe you want to talk about it, best practices or sure. flip side horror stories. I don't know what, how you want to <laughs> approach this. Um, I'll let you take this one. Sure, sure. Um, let, let's use a, a, a most popular organization and Amazon. Amazon pre-pandemic did not necessarily have a golden rule on authenticated barcodes or GTINs or any of the above. When the pandemic hit, they ran into some serious problems because while things are running and everything's hunky-dory, a lot of folks wanted to get their product sold through Amazon because it was one of the only means that they could move the product in. Then the issue started with, we'll call them fraudulent or non-authentic barcodes. If you are to order, um, a green pair of shoes and you get a white t-shirt sent to your home, there's a fundamental problem. The robot over at Amazon doesn't recognize whether it's green or white or blue. It recognizes the code and it picks the item from that bin in a code. Now, everyone wanting to sell their products, not a problem. They buy a $10 barcode online and that barcode has been assigned to two, three different people already gets into Amazon, they don't verify the reality or the traceability of that item. We're moving product. It's going to be coming out of Mississauga. That's fine. There's a warehouse there and it's coming out, but we're picking the wrong product because it's, it's assigned already. It's been resold. And for whatever it's worth, there's a little bit of a black market out there in buying and reselling barcodes. We have licenses. You don't own the barcode, you own the license. And that license is authenticated and it is yours and yours only. Now, an Amazon of the world in today's transactions is asking every vendor in Canada to have a GTIN and a GS1 barcode. Why? 
they're able to verify the le le legitimacy of that barcode against the data pool. Is it recognizable? Is all the information complete? That's the power of the data, and that's the power of verifying. So I'm using the good, bad, greatest example with Amazon because they moved probably the most product in the world. Fantastic. Are you so, seeing other and marketplaces? that has changed. That has changed. Yeah. Right. Other marketplaces as well, like other large marketplaces. Yeah, you know, when we talk. Direction? Sure. When we talk Google, they're strongly recommending. And these are the types of things that, you know, at our senior level, uh, our folks deal with these trading partners and say, hey, here are the benefits. This is what you ran into. Here are the benefits, which is exactly what happened with Amazon. They obviously knew they had challenges. And keeping in mind, they're the vendor and they have to assume the responsibility of recalling and reshipping all these items back and forth because the consumer didn't get the right item or the inventory controls wrong or, 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 or. Um, so yes, we're seeing a trend going in that direction. If we go back to the food industry, you know, your Sobeys of the world with their voila uh, banner, they use the system. You need to have a GTIN in there so that they're able to pick exactly the, the product that customers are looking for. So it is a moving trend in that direction. And for us, we're already equipped. So it's a question of them getting the buy-in and then getting part of our registry as what we call a DR, a data recipient. They receive the information, whether as a manufacturer, is a provider, data provider, data recipient. Right. But Interesting. In, they, they, they pool into the same database. Right. Very interesting. So... I'm just wondering, since we were on, you know, basically risk mitigation, you can mitigate a lot of risks, a lot of costs by having, you know, a, a, a GTIN, a proper, you know, not a fake barcode, a proper barcode, because I'm sure Amazon then passes those costs along to the, the seller, right? The, the manufacturer. Yeah, to a certain extent, their cost to, to them is being part of our registry. The right. cost of the brand owner is to get a license for that GTIN and whatever services they're going to need to provide and fulfill the need for that trading partner. We're talking online. When we're talking retail brick and mortar shops, they may need Plano information. They may need e-commerce information. They may need more imaging. You know, Amazon needs at least four pictures. And when we're when we're seeing where they're going, probably six now. Well, that content and imaging is something GS1 does for brand owners and for people importing to make sure that they are in compliance to the requisitions and needs of the trading partner. If it's six images, 1250 pixels as a minimum, so on, so on, so on, so on, that's what we do. And to ensure that, again, you don't have a fallback once you're ready to move your product, then it's sitting somewhere in a warehouse because you're not in full compliance. Right, right. And I was on your website and I did see, you know, manage my G10, isn't there? <laughs> That's the area um, where you have all that data, where you can manage all of that data, including the images and you call all the product attributes, right? Correct. That's exactly it. Boy, you're a pro. I, I did my I did my research. I did a Way little bit of go. studying. Way to go. <laughs> I was a student. <laughs> um, okay, before I see we have we've had some questions. I did get some questions online in advance. But before we dive into the questions, and thank you everyone, and please keep the questions coming. But I wanted to ask you, Ale, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen that you've seen businesses make? with respect to product data and barcodes, if you can share any insights with you know, folks on this webinar today. Yeah, I guess first and foremost is um, maybe going a quick and dirty route. Um, I mentioned before, you can get a $10 barcode. If you're serious about getting in with trading partners of importance, you're going to be uh, sent backpacking. So that is the first thing. The second thing is going a little bit too far in your process without having checked enough boxes off. And it all revolves around time, efficiency, and cost. 
if you've gone down a road where um, you, you've printed labels or cases or even your marketing or even taken pictures with a professional or a marketing firm only to realize that they're not going to fly because you didn't fulfill all the needs of that trading partner, those are the common mistakes. Can I take pictures with my you know, iPhone or my Android? Sure you can. Will they be accepted? Probably not. Are you going to move and shake and do it? You probably will. We're all culprits of it. Now, if you're only wanting to do this in a small way and put it on your own little website, there is no problem there. It's when you want to get in with some bigger trading partners that there are requisites they need and they need to be fulfilled. And if you're going to be serious about growing your business, those are the routes that we always encourage you to take. And what we're trying to do is get those folks as far enough as possible in advance to share what we're sharing here today so they can think about it, plan it, budget it, because there's cost involved. You know we're a cost recovery organization. It's going to cost you money to get your license and the services and your images done. That's all part and parcel of it. But at the end of the day, to do it right from the get-go versus tripping all over, do the math and the calculation, again, you want to sell your product. You want to get it to market. Try and check off all the boxes as soon as possible. Those Fantastic. are the common ones that we get. Pictures, and then, oh boy, I printed you know 5,000 labels. Well, for a small organization starting off, that's something. Or I didn't think of the packaging correctly. Or my trading partner is looking for two other packages, but I've only got one a little bit of the planning, the research, and when you're ready to fly, be ready. Because when you get that PO, I know from experience from these larger guys, you better be ready to go. Because if you're not ready to go, you're off the bandwagon. That's uh -huh. just a reality without, you know, scaring anyone in the process. That's just a reality. No, but we do our fair share of fear mongering as well, because we all know mistakes in international trade can be very costly. So wow. all of our fit skills training is geared around mitigating risks. You know, sometimes that order from an, you know, a foreign um a foreign buyer, sometimes if you haven't done that planning, if you haven't done, you know, looked at your your own, done the whole feasibility and gap analysis, maybe you can't actually afford to ship it to uh, right. to that market because the landed costs are going to be so much. So instead of being reactionary, uh, it takes a lot initially to prepare. And so a lot of what you were saying, I can see how this fits into our training um, at the product development stage and, and our right. planning, because our fit skills training is all about planning to expand into global markets. And, and whether that's selling products or procuring products, there are a lot of considerations. And so there's barcodes and product data and compliance and all of that should be at that planning stage, really. Um, yeah, like, it's just yeah. something to keep in mind. I, I know for a small business owner or somebody trying to move product, it's a lot of things. It's a lot of hats to wear. We just encourage you, keep it in mind. Keep your product identification in mind. Way beyond just getting a barcode because there's a lot more attached to that infamous barcode or GTIN um, that you're going to need when you grow your business. So it's just yeah. it's something to keep in, keep in mind. The cost analysis about moving the product, that's probably for a, <laughs> another session. But I always encourage, get your cost of goods down, real down and path, but include that budgeting process. You want to ship across the sea, you make sure there's a dollar involved left in there for you because you got mm -hmm. you got to make a profit. Yeah, and we, we do, our training does cover that. Um, our courses cover that, you know, knowing what truly is your landed cost. And, right on. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so it is 1.45 uh, Eastern Standard Time. So I said we would leave the last 15 minutes to dive into questions. Um, so thank you very much. I see some questions in the Q&A. So thank you for those. But I wanted to ask just one question that I saw on LinkedIn when we were promoting this event. And I thought it was a great question. So somebody asked, are barcodes coming to an end to be replaced with QR codes? And I thought that was really interesting. 
So if you can quickly answer that one. Sure, sure. Great question. Great question. We talked before about the different symbologies, the different encoding of information within an EN 8, 12, 13, 14. Where the future is going is 2D. What is 2D? It's, it's a combination, and come back to your QR code. It's a combination of a linear code, which we understand to be right now, and the QR code. The QR code being usually a link for information back to a site or to a third-party site or to um, someone trying to promote something. So, And it starts and stops there. The QR code is not a point of sale code as we know it now. So what has happened over the last little while, on some products you'll notice a linear code, a barcode, GTIN, and a QR code. So the QR code is there to give the consumer and the buyers more information on the product. Where was it made? Where was it imported from? Who made it? Was there fair trade? Was it this? Was it that? Where we're going with this is the combination of both elements into one code, which is going to be called the GS1 data matrix code. It's going to look a little like a QR code, but without the three boxes in the corner. That is the next phase, which is going to be introduced uh, Jan 1st, 2027. What that's going to mean is your brand manufacturers and, and, and uh, uh, trading partners, your retailers, will have to start adapting to be able to scan and read that GS1 data matrix code and also keep a transition with the linear. We don't think the linear is totally going to disappear because for some organizations, that's plenty. They don't need to give any more information on that product. But for example, in the cannabis world and in the pharma world, you'll notice on your Tylenol and your aspirin boxes, it's already a GS1 data matrix code. They have transitioned already because they want to give as much information medically and from a cannabis standpoint. They want to know exactly where it was grown, what the TCH uh, levels are, and so on. And so for the consumer, the pharmacist, the medical world, that information has become key. So it's already in progress. And over the next few years, you'll see that 2D code replace the typical linear 12-digit code. That's where we're going. Interesting, interesting. And I'm glad you mentioned healthcare and pharmaceuticals because our first question that came in um, from Ryan Haynes um, is talking about products in the healthcare industry, specifically those licensed at a, as a medical device in Canada. So just wondering, and I don't know if you've read the question, Alain, probably not no. because you've been busy talking, <laughs> but if you can talk a little bit, because um, he mentions hospitals and long-term care homes don't scan UPC codes since they're not retailing it. Um, and if the product being sold domestically, international trade, trade partners aren't yet involved, but can you think of any reasons why correct GTINs and the, the whole hierarchy is important in this sector. If they're not- yeah, it, go, Sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, no, if they're not point of sale, if you know some of these in the case of long-term care home, for example, or hospitals, don't scan that. Right, um, there's two areas. There's the distribution level, which uh, from a medical device standpoint can have its product ID, all right? But then it doesn't make it into some of the homes. It is changing. A lot of that landscape is changing because of the medical, uh, especially when it comes to medication. They want to be able to control and know exactly the medication, who it's for, how it's for. But those are huge databases that are being worked on with the different health organizations in Canada. But as a basic rule, any device that's going to be sold at a POS level, whether it's a medical device or a pharma device, will have a GETIN or should have a GETIN and a barcode. Where there's a bit of a gap is exactly what you're bring, bringing it to. They're not equipped to read these things. But somewhere along the line, there's a distributor or somebody as an intermediate that is selling those products to, you know, OHIP as an example in Ontario, and then they supply the hospitals and the and the different areas. It is increasing, 
and they want to increase. Hence, the 2D barcodes that are coming down the pipe. They're going to encompass all that information. Now, software needs to be updated. Hardware will need to be put in some of these facilities. So there's costs involved, but there's also the control aspect of really wanting to master all the control over either a device or prescription or pharma drugs and or any other issue in that sector or items in that sector. Interesting. Great question. Thank you for that. And thank you for the answer. Um, so we have a CITP, Peter Gray, that's asking um, on the retailer and customer side, I, I understand or I understood that modern scanners are capable of scanning, scanning North American and European barcodes. True? Yes. Oh, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a GDIN, as a general rule, it's not an issue. Now, there could be exceptions um, between equipment, but they are recognizable and they are scannable as a general rule. Yes. Okay. Um, so along those lines, we have another CITP, Audrey Ross. Uh, thank you for your question. She's, she's asking, is there, are there any consideration or is there consideration for more tracing via the G10? i.e. forced labor legislation and supply chain tracking. Absolutely. These, uh, and you hit on it before, Laura, these are what we consider attributes in our system. And we constantly evolve. I'll give you an example. Sustainability is a big buzzword in our industry these days. ESG is a big, big buzzword. These are all attributes and things that we add to our system. Certification of product. So it will prompt you as you're in the system, are you compliant? Are you this? Are you that? And we, for us, want to share that information with all the intermediates in play. So yes, to answer that question and to add to it, that 2D barcode, once equipped, will be able to carry all that information in there. Was it properly built? Was it imported? Was there child labor involved? On and on and on and on. So that traceability, not only from point A to point B, is the traceability with the content attached. And that's the power of getting more information within that data pool so that everyone can be better informed uh, right to the consumer. Wow, that's interesting. I was just thinking of in terms of ESG and I was recently in a workshop. So this is, that's quite interesting to be able to tie that into the, into the G10 and that data. All management. the information that follows that product, be it one product or another, or one sector or another. You know, we talked about medical or pharma a little bit before. They're all different sectors. They right. all have their little particularities, but from a data standpoint, quality data is the key. And we want to be able to, or the industry wants to be able to add even more information that's carried throughout this database. Absolutely. Great. So we have another question here from Ryan Haynes. What is the difference or slash implication of a draft G10 versus an activated G10 in the Manage My G10s portal? Um, um. <laughs> we we have we have a user we have a user i'm going on record this this individual is a user the difference is and it's an excellent question you don't want to waste any jetons because as i mentioned before once you activate or put a jeton on the market it cannot be reused so if you went oops it's blue instead of red sorry there are a few exceptions but generally, you can't reuse once a barcode or a GTIN is in activate mode. So you can have 50 draft GTINs in preparation to make sure you have all your info, your labels, your product pitch. If you leave those in draft, you can leave those in draft indefinitely. And you can go in and revisit and make as many changes as possible until you're sure that GTIN is activated and your product is going to be on the market. Once it's activated, it takes a life of its own. So you can have, again, as many products in draft mode and in manage my GTINs, you see that, you know, that dashboard will show you how you have 50 GTINs 
Uh, 30 of them are in draft, 10 of them are activated, and 10 unused. You will see that snapshot in your dashboard. Again, key thing, if you're not sure, don't activate, leave it in draft, make all your changes. And once you're ready to fly, activate your Jetons and away you go. That, that is a great question. And I can tell <laughs> that uh, we do have a user on the line, which is, Absolutely. Which is fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Um, that was, I was just thinking, um, along those lines, I know that, uh, I had seen another, another webinar that you were a part of, and there <laughs> were talking about, you ha actually had a startup that was on the line and they were talking about a merger or an acquisition. And then all of a sudden, some of those proprietary issues, with the G tens and with the licenses, can you maybe explain that a sure. little bit? Sure. A G ten is reusable upon a purchase of an organ an organization or assets. You need the release of that information from the previous owner. So company A is selling its company and its product to company B. Company B doesn't have a GS one subscription. Company A has the GS1 subscription. Company B will need to get a GS1 subscription, but will be able to use the existing GS1 GTINs if they get the formal release letter from the previous owner. Releasing that information, giving the right to the company B to not only produce, pack, and sell that item the same way it was when company A was selling it. Now, if there is a change to an ingredient or a recipe or a color or a size with company B, they're going to need a new GTIN anyways. It falls within the management rules of those GTINs. But if everything is equal, they buy the company, they buy the rights to the product, they can use the GTIN. Company A has to release that information in a formal letter that's given to GS1, and they can use the GTIN. Wonderful. That's Great essentially, essentially how it works. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I don't see any more questions, and I'm looking at the time. So maybe before we close, and we also have a poll that we're going to launch, but just if you can, this is the firing line, just 60 seconds. Sure. Or less, what would be your best <laughs> advice uh, that you can you can provide to folks on this webinar today? Best advice. Uh, there are many, but I'm going to give you my top one. You are the brand owner. You own that brand. Have that brand fully represent who you are and what you're trying to do. And then start checking off your boxes. The best advice is when you're going to pitch that product, the more organized and professional you're able to bring and serious about moving your product, the best results you're going to be able to get. So plan, budget, and represent your brand as best as you can. Don't send cheap pictures. Send quality pictures. Don't put poor data. Put quality data, quality lines. Think about your marketing. You want to sell your product, make an impression, because you usually only have one chance to make a first impression. I love that. As an international sales and marketing geek myself, <laughs> I love that. that. That's fantastic. <laughs> so thank you so much, Alain and GS1 Canada. Linda, I haven't even looked at the chat really, but I see that you've been dropping lots of links, lots of information. So thank you so much. Thank you um, for you know your expertise, your insights on this highly, highly relevant topic. Um, so I'd love, I, you know, I really want to thank the CITPs in our audience, the students, our FIT community, our GS1 community, and all guests for this great discussion, these great questions. Um, I'm just thrilled with today. I know I've learned a lot. Um, so Anna from our marketing team is about to launch a quick, just a, a quick feedback uh, poll, if you can answer that. Just on a scale of one to five, how valuable you found the information presented today. 
because the information will help us or this your your opinion your your feedback will help us plan future events so thank you if you can uh, just quickly reply to that today um this event, as we mentioned at the onset, uh, this event is being recorded. It will be posted on FIT's YouTube channel and a link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. Um, we do look forward to seeing some of you uh, or many of you at future events. So please follow us on social media or subscribe to our weekly newsletter to learn more about events that we have in the hopper for, for the future. So. Thank you everyone again and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. And thank you again, Alain and GS1 Pleasure. Canada. This was a great partnership today.